Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the Purposeful Marketing Podcast. Aaron here, and a repeat guest, friend of the program, Caleb Rule. This is part two. We may do a trilogy. We're just talking about that as well. What we're going to do on today's show is talk about a big question. If you're a new listener to Purposeful Marketing Podcast, what we do is we bring on marketing experts like Caleb himself to really talk us through a tactic, our big idea, and through that dialogue, we deconstruct it, rip it apart, hopefully you find some truth within it, and then within your day, practitioner's job as a marketer. That's what we do in the Purposeful Marketing Show, so we're going to do it again today with a big question of who owns the CRM? This is an important question because the last time Caleb was on the show, we talked about creating an inbound motion from scratch. And the CRM is a part of it. And who owns those different individual pieces to build that puzzle is what we need to solve. That's what we're going to do today. But a little different format, we're actually going to read some posts from other marketers asking these questions, and then we're going to react to it. So we're going to try this out today. First time ever. Love it. I'll read the first one, Caleb, and I'll get your reaction, and we'll keep rolling. Sounds like a plan. All right. So for listeners, this is a post. Um, these are all coming from Exit 5, great community. Caleb and I were just talking about it. Um, I was in there a while ago as it was Dave Gerhardt's community. Then he rebranded. Ask Caleb about it. He'll give you a reco. He'll get you in there. Okay. So in the community, there was a post by Mark Stoos, who's the CEO of Proof Analytics. And here was his question in statement. I think that the reality I see today is that IT is leading the purchase implementation and maintenance of the CRM and most other ERP like software, but the use cases and optimization is driven from the GTM functions, but channeled through IT. So it's a partnership that said, it is now super obvious that finance doesn't trust GTM functions with the spending of money and IT doesn't trust them with the use of systems like CRM. We are seeing a lot of new tools being strapped into these ERPs to understand utilization and kick the function in the butt if things flag. Caleb, how does that make you feel? What does it make you think? Well, first off, I, it makes me feel great because uh, Mark, um, if, if, and he, I know he's been on other Proofpoint podcasts as well. Uh, he's an excellent follow on LinkedIn. Uh, and yeah, I, he was the first person I thought of and reached out to because he's a CMO turned CEO. So I actually chatted him directly just to get his thoughts on this. Um, and to be honest with you, it's interesting because Mark is talking to a lot of, we're talking, you know, major player companies and he's talking to C-level executives up there. So these are conversations he's having that maybe somebody like me is not having on a daily basis. Um, it makes sense in terms of marketing's viability seems to be called into question every day, right? But even more so now as money has become more expensive, interest rates are higher, CFOs are cracking down and are actually getting gaining more power within the C-suite. Um, and they're going to look at IT and go, IT usually has their ducks in a row. Does marketing have their ducks in a row? And so when it comes to something like IT, which could be a half million dollar investment, it could be a $5 million investment. What's the ROI of a significant tech stack investment with this foundational platform that's used cross-functionally throughout the entirety of the organization and probably on a global scale? Um, you know, the default would probably be, hey, IT is going to be able to manage this. There's a lot of risk reduction. Uh, you know, one of the one of the phrases, you know, we've all heard it is nobody ever got fired for buying IBM, right? Okay, sure, you could have bought this newer, more innovative thing or process or brought in a new company, but why would you go away from what's considered a safe option? And in this case, IT is kind of a safer option. Uh, and that's where a lot of, I would say, companies are kind of built from the ground up. Hey, IT, you're going to manage this and be the primary stakeholder for any sort of tech debt um, that the organization might have. Curious if you agree or disagree with that. Yeah, I think the two hot takes within this um, remark from Mark, which you asked him, is, again, IT has a seat at the table with the CRM and that finance doesn't trust um, the GTM functions to spend money. I, those are the two most interesting things. And I think to unpack this, we brought a couple people to talk about marketing ops um, on the last couple episodes um, after your episode, and they've enlightened me even more, which the challenge is scale. So scale is such an issue with the CRM because 
if you s scale it so much, you're going to need IT. You're going to need that partnership, right? So that's why um, one of your messages to me, Caleb, was talking about like big businesses versus small. <laughs> you know, there's a couple of different layers here, right? You may be the one person marketing team that controls a CRM and maybe you have one IT partner. <laughs> but when you're talking about these big Fortune 50 companies, um, IT has to be involved within the CRM process. I think if you're a marketer at the one house, um, one marketer, only marketer at the house, you don't have these challenges and that's something you don't really need to think about, but you should have that in mind as you scale, what are the partnerships you need to form as you go? I think that's the lesson I'm taking from that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, just because IT really is, it's always under-resourced and always underappreciated and yet, right? None of these Fortune 50 companies got to where they are without a sustainable IT function. Uh, every single part of the organization relies on IT. If IT is doing their job, then you never hear about them, of course, right? It's like a referee in a football game. You never want to hear about them because then everything is working well. Um, and yet, <clears throat> IT is also involved in highly strategic decisions, especially when thinking about three, five, 10 year road mapping exercises. You've got CIOs and CTOs and, and VPs of, of IT who they're the ones sitting at the revenue table as well. And they will, you know, they have that authority to kind of chime in. And, you know, going, going back to that point around, there is distrust around different go-to-market functions. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're trying to be product-led, sales-led, which is, you know, kind of traditional a little bit, whether you're something else, right? It doesn't matter whatever LG uh, you have. Um, there is distrust because, okay, you're spending money. Is that ROI actually there? IT usually can tell you to a dime exactly what the ROI of what they're doing is. And therefore, they have earned that trust over years. Um, and I mean, and of course, when something goes wrong, who do we get to? IT, can you bail me out? We all have stories with IT. It, you know. But again, these are at larger organizations. If you're at a smaller place, you maybe have one IT person, or maybe maybe it's just a couple of folks. And so then, yeah, then I think the conversation changes. But starting off uh, with larger organizations, you know, you I don't think you can take IT out of the picture. It's not going to happen. Yeah, I think one very nuanced statement we're making is like you have to be closer to the business objectives, and you have to prove your case that you're spending money wisely. And you can take that lesson out of the CRM conversation. Like your job as a marketer, you have to answer that. Now, Mary would always say the best CRM is a CRM that's used. And then she'd also say the person who owns a CRM is the one who uses it the most. I think there can definitely be a partnership of um, marketing and IT owning and sales. Maybe it's a combination of all three. Again, revenue is a team sport. You're gonna need the CRM to really show revenue. So you're all gonna have to work together. I think we've talked about that idea enough. Do you want to read the next one, Caleb? Yeah, so uh, so actually an old um, acquaintance of mine uh, working actually in the manufacturing space, Craig Drink, the uh, Vice President of Information Technology at Club Car. So we're talking a manufacturing company. Uh, and he was actually the IT business partner uh, who uh, I, uh, in marketing, would go to. So he was on a, a council and uh, he's been since promoted uh, a couple of times, I think. Um, and so I just, I, he, he was the second person I thought about said, Hey, Craig, you literally lived this with me, right? When, when we were actually implementing Salesforce across, it was in the Ingersoll Rand enterprise, the global enterprise club car was just one of the business units. Train was, was another well-known business unit, Thermo Fish, uh, not Thermo Fisher. Uh, now I'm blanking on a couple of the others. Um, I'm recovering from COVID. So I have a slight COVID <laughs> brain going on. Uh, so, so nobody hold that against me, I hope. Um, but here's what he said. I asked him, hey, what about, you know, IT owning the CRM? What do you think? And he said, your statement on owning is complicated. And I went, all right, here we go. Absolutely true. In my opinion, remember he's IT. IT should own the implementation of any CRM related projects, primary support and administration. Again, we lived this uh, and they absolutely did. Additionally, I think the businesses should have an identified owner that works as partners with IT. This, this includes joint governance of the system, so both are aligned on existing and future usage. So I asked him a follow-up question to that, and I went, okay, <clears throat> excuse me. how does this work well when there's multiple teams, right? Because think of all the teams that are get logging into the CRM, pulling, pushing data on a daily basis. You've got sales, marketing, customer success, which for, for larger organizations, that's a very robust um, 
team, you've got maybe you have rev ops, marketing ops, you have uh, data flows going in and out and to all sorts of integrations, right? Whether it's uh, analyst teams. And so, uh, you know, they're using it for their own intended areas, but should one team be primarily responsible for the platform's return on investment? Uh, and I asked him point blank, what about RevOps? You know, is this where a tech team like RevOps comes into play? And he said, in my opinion, you're on the right track. Governance would allow all functions a seat at the table, but it's best to have one as the lead owner that makes the final call. Now, functionally, I've seen this. IT was the one who made the final call. Um, they were the ones who, and this was when we were at Club Car. This is five, six years ago at, at the time of recording. Um, but if you wanted some development work, like Salesforce development work, then, okay, you would route your request to IT, to their council, you'd present your business case, and then they would approve or deny. Um, in that case, it made sense because it was a CRM implementation project and it was on a massive scale. This is a $500 million plus company. I'm sure it's more now. Um, I'm just trying to think, is that the preferred method though? Or is that out of necessity based on decades of how things have always been done? I kind of like the thought of having a dedicated RevOps function, but in that context, I wonder if it would thrive. Curious your thoughts. Yeah, I think what is interesting about Craig's comment in general is, is this idea of governance. And I think everything we're talking about, the caveat is it depends. <laughs> it depends if you're in SaaS, industrial, if you're a startup, what series of startup you are, what vertical, it, it depends. But I love this idea about governance because I think that's applicable to any size business. And Something that I think works for kind of my space with professional services is like having that um, director of growth come in who is a partner of sales and marketing in the CEO, right? So they're not a proclaimed marketer. They're doing the governance of, we have to get the CRM right so we can show the revenue for everyone. Sales, what are you dealing with, right? I want to make sure that this CRM is actually used in the field. You're actually using and putting the inputs and using the right data sources. Marketing, what are you trying to attribute, right? Um, okay, CEO, what do you need to show in your board reports, <laughs> right? Like, how does the CRM going to help that? So I think I'm talking through a very specific case for me that works with governance. I think governance is something that everyone should think about with their CRM, and you're going to have to identify that person. I think that was the most interesting thing to me. Anything else you want to talk about in that post? Uh, I mean, leave it to a VP with an IT to think about governance, right? Uh, but again, that's where IT bails people like us out who are too busy focused maybe on other things. Hey, the infrastructure is, is what's going to allow you to scale, right? We talked about scalability being yeah. a key earlier. That governance, and I know Proofpoint, y'all have been doing a lot of this, where it's like documentation, right? Um, it, it is, is the key to all things success, uh, both now and moving forward. And so I agree with that. The biggest question is, all right, who owns that process then, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I would kind of want IT to, to own that process. I don't think I would want to have the team that owns it. But again, if there's a team, and again, a larger organization, you might be able to spin up a RevOps function. And that would not, probably need to operate in a center of excellence type of model uh, where maybe they have a, 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 they're a direct report to a specific C-suite member, maybe like a chief revenue officer, ideally, something to that effect. Uh, but they're working jointly, as you said earlier. Revenue is a joint team sport. It's not just one team that's going to be mm -hmm. impacting that. And so um, it, it does upset kind of tr some traditional org charts, though. Uh, you know, when you think about larger organizations, you have sales, you have marketing. They're usually their own standalone teams. Sometimes they're reporting up to their own C-suite members. Sometimes it's to the same C-suite uh, member. Customer service is its own function. IT is its own function. What binds them all together? So having this other floating team almost that's specifically focused on tech, governance, process orientation, using those fields. Are we actually using these 23 custom fields or can we just get rid of them? Is this just junk, right? Who's going to actually ask those questions and then drive the work home? You know, I do think that there's a reason revenue operations is, is continues to gain traction in the marketplace, but we're going to see more major players may be adopting something to that effect over the next five to 10 years because of this. You know, something I feel strongly as we're talking about is, again, I think scale is the challenge. I think governance is maybe that piece that helps you with the scale. IT is going to have to be part of it, especially as we're thinking about these big businesses. It's impossible to do it without IT, right? You need that um, use the word infrastructure. Yes, <laughs> that infrastructure has to be there. And I've been a part of these very major projects of, 
um, moving a CRM system with a big company. Oh my goodness, right? <laughs> I don't know how we would do it without IT. So I think that's like a key learning from this as we're talking. Um, another thing with RevOps, you know, I think this idea of the job title doesn't matter. It's the mm -hmm. outcome, right? And the job function matters, but doesn't need a department either, right? I don't need RevOps. I don't need this job title. Who's the person that can give me the outcome to show the ROI of the CRM? I think that's what companies need to do. And again, if you're a, a executive, you need to get the right kind of players to do that. And I think that's going to depend on, again, your vertical, your, your space, kind of um, how big your company is. But I think if you can answer that, you're going to get closer to this. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, and that makes a whole lot of sense, right? Okay, what's the outcome you're trying to achieve? Tie everything to, to the outcomes and then it all kind of flows from there. Okay, the outcome that I would ask if I was a leader would be, how do we get greater return on our investment here? Especially if I'm spending six or seven figures on this system. Now, if you're a smaller company, maybe you're not, maybe you have a smaller system, but still scalability, right? If you're thinking, hey, our business is going to grow ideally two to 300 to 400% year over year, right? If you're smaller and you're growing, how are we going to make sure that our technology is able to keep up with that growth and sustain additional headcount? Are the processes in place? And that's why I do wonder if even having that one dedicated operations person, uh, whether it's marketing operations, revenue operations, again, whatever you want to call them, but having somebody who owns that business is, is more crucial than I think a lot of founders and a lot of leaders might give that person credit for, which is why, you know, we, we see revenue operations leaders, um, they're kind of put on a pedestal a little bit because there's so few of them. That's, that's the problem, right? You've interviewed a few of them and I'm sure you're going to interview more, but there's so few of them today that it is um, highly technical skills that also build bridges across whatever company, whether this company size is two people, 10 people, or 2,000 people or more. Um, and yet they're all kind of wrapping it together in something that is touching on some heroes. You know, sp speaking of those interviews, because it does remind me, we talked to um, Cindy Mulligan and Mike Rizzo, listen to those episodes. A common theme was marketing ops, rev ops is not in the leadership conversation in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I think when we think about governance, when we think about who owns it, IT, I think that function needs to be there at the beginning um, and it will solve a lot of problems. Um, again, I'm in the marketing function. <laughs> I don't do that piece. So it's really hard for me to say what you should and shouldn't do. But I definitely think like that's part of like the solve is like figuring that out to get us to other, but I think we've talked about that one enough. <laughs> um, do you want to do one of the kind of more social posts? that were yeah, Seth Nagel. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this has been, um, you know, and, and you know, you just said, Hey, you work in marketing and so do I, right. But who owns the CRM? Well, you're talking about other teams. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to ask some other people, right? Mark Staus is, uh, he's a CEO, he's a former CMO, but he talks with a lot of CFOs, CROs, CEOs, right? So his perspective would be a little, take me outside in my box, Craig, VP of IT, again, taking me outside in my marketer's hat a little bit. Um, within the Exit 5 community, I asked a few people, these are marketing folks, but I'm very uh, surprised, to be honest with you, uh, that, the, that we've got three more coming up and none of the three said the same thing, um, which I thought was fascinating. So Seth Nagel, uh, coming, coming to this quote first, um, you know, he said, the direction to take often depends on the company's structure and the team's skill sets, which kind of gets back to maybe, you know, the size. In small and more agile companies, I'm a strong advocate for marketing taking the reins. I went, ooh, okay, here we go. Um, th because they can respond quickly to changes. They can adapt campaigns on the fly and maintain a nimble tech stack that aligns with marketing objectives. However, as a company scales and the systems grow in complexity, IT's involvement becomes critical. Their expertise ensures robust security, scalability, and integration with other mission-critical tools. Uh, and then he went on to talk more about processes, organization, and documentation really being the gold standards, which we've, we've kind of talked about. Uh, but in other words, you know, Seth said, in his view, the ideal scenario is a harmonious partnership between marketing and IT with each levering their own strengths. I think in smaller companies, that might have to be a default, to be honest with you, because you always have that first marketing hire, and that comes fairly early. Um, but who's your first tech hire? When does that even happen, right? You know, I did some research. And I didn't find uh, anything that was necessarily definitive where it's like, all right, here's our here's when you hire a director of IT. 
or here's when you hire a director of RevOps. But marketing, you might be able to get something and then you can outsource to uh, to a Mike Rizzo or a Sydney Milligan or something, right? Hey, I can pull in marketing operations professionals because that's an established niche within marketing now. And so it just makes more sense on how to run a business here today and maybe for the next five to 10 years. What do you think? Yeah, one other lesson from his post specifically in what we're talking about is I think you have to have a human element, a part of this to get that harmony. And no matter if you're a small business or big business, you need that person to own governance, to be empathetic, to help articulate and communicate. Um, it could be someone at an executive level. Maybe it's someone on red ops, maybe it's marking ops. I think that's a missing piece to this puzzle. Um, cause again, when we're asked the question of who owns it, the reality is everyone owns it. <laughs> you know, you're a business, you got to make revenue. Everyone knows the CRM. But to really get things moving, to get the point across, to get um, those actions taken care of, I think you really need that person. Because I, I love this idea of harmony is essentially like you're just trying to build this like beautiful structure that everyone's a part of, right? Kumbaya. <laughs> I think, kumbaya. It's too contentious sometimes, right? With you know, mm -hmm. IT, sales, and marketing. I think that's something we all need to work um, through, right? Is, again, it's team sport. Everyone needs to use a CRM. We all have to make revenue or we die. <laughs> so it's like... Harmony, like, how do we get here? So I think that was um, good from Seth. The other actually, piece, I, I, go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry, jump. You know, I did actually ask, okay, where the where sales? If marketing and IT are kind of the leading partners in, you know, with this, but sales is living and breathing in, in the CRM. So where does sales uh, come into play? And his thought was actually something I had not heard of before. Sales is the feedback loop that mm. enables you to iterate your marketing campaigns. Um, and so they should be the feedback loop on how the CRM is, is operating, but marketing and sales, marketing and IT are the ones that are driving the development and therefore the ROI forward, which I thought was interesting. Um, I wonder if that puts a little bit of, of sales responsibility on marketing shoulders, but then again, that's kind of the trend that we're going, right? Is that mm -hmm. marketing, you know, more and more leaders are understanding that marketing owns more of the customer journey than sales does, even if you can't easily attribute it. Right, that that ninety percent before before they're ever there, and then sales owns the last mile, a very important last mile. I love salespeople; don't come hunting me. Uh, but um, but it, it, marketing's impact is seen well before sales ever sees the people, and so I'm wondering if the CRM just starts to slowly model that. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm sure Mary would have a POV on that because what she talks about with like map my customers again is they're building that CRM specifically for sales. Mm -hmm. And specifically for sales who are out in the field, right? So it's not that they don't want to be a part of the conversation. It's that they need to use a CRM in the space that they're at with the customer. Now, how do you take that CRM, them in the field, you make it easier for them to use so I can get funneled back to marketing so marketing can learn what they need to do to help sales win. That was one thought. And then the other piece that just came to mind is I really think as we go forward <laughs> in this um, new millennium, <laughs> Marketing and sales like comes together, whatever that like title is called, right? I think mm. to be good, you have to be good at both. And I think to answer some of these big questions, you have to be good at both. And to um, evolve in your career, you have to be good at both. So that was just another random thought I had as you're talking. Marketer, a lot, there's a lot of marketers that would benefit from doing some cold calling and cold yeah. outreach because <laughs> I, I, you know, we see the bashing on LinkedIn sometimes and I, I've done it. And oh boy, did I, I mean, I clammed up the first time I ever tried to make a cold call. I was like, people do this for a living. This is awful, right? Just, it's hard. It's hard. Hey, let me call a random stranger who's never heard of me before. Yeah. You're going to get hung up on 15 times or ignored all day. Right. And yet that's, that's your livelihood. Sales is hard. Uh, and marketing mm -hmm. is, is sales biggest cheerleader always has and always, always will be. Um, and so I, I, I do think, um, I, I think Mary's going to come back from vacation and be wondering, hang on, what is this Caleb guy I've been talking about? So yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will prepare, I will prepare my LinkedIn mode accordingly, and then it will not work at all because Mary's far more powerful than I am over there. Uh, so. Yeah, she is the, I wish she was here because she have, may have a different perspective, but um, let's get to maybe Quincy J Johnson's. You want to read his? And yeah. So uh, Quincy, another one who, who kind of chimed in, I think he's over at uh, compound growth marketing. Um, and so he said, it should be a partner and accountable for the tech, but should not own CRM or the marketing automation platform. They often don't have the bigger picture vantage point or use cases of the tech. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I asked who should own it. Marketing should own the map and be a majority owner in the CRM, but partnering with sales. Now the map, I think, 
I tend to agree with that. I think that's a separate conversation for that piece of technology. Although MAP and CRM are bi-directionally synced typically, they're very you know jointly integrated. Their use cases are a little bit separate and it's called a marketing automation platform. So you know I would expect that to probably fall into marketing. Uh, but for the CRM, um, the reason for the marketing majority ownership is that BDR and SDRs should sit closely with marketing if not in the marketing department, that's a whole conversation on so, uh, right? Uh, and then they can help inform the operational side, key points that should be displayed to sales, automating sales processes and enablement. Now this gets to an interesting, it depends situation, mm -hmm. right? Which you talked about earlier, which is, okay, what is marketing's relationship with sales, right? Because there are parts where there is sales enablement. Marketing's job is to make sales life easier to some degree, absolutely. Now sales needs to, uh, run on its own and, and, and various components. And that's a balancing act. I'm not, uh, you know, th mm -hmm. there's a lot of tentacles to that conversation, which we don't have time for today. Um, I agree with how some of the data is displayed to sales because sales, you want them, you, you want to make it as easy as possible because you want them selling, quite frankly, you don't want them losing time and wasting operational inefficiencies on trying to find that contact, trying to find that lead, trying to get the opportunity updated, streamline that process so they can go to close the deal and everybody wins more. At the same point, how much of the sales process should be owned by marketing? Like, should marketing be cleaning up some of the sales stuff? Because we've all been there where a salesperson either doesn't update the CRM. And in fact, marketing charts, I was looking at some data, uh, you know, some, some of the research. That's one of the biggest complaints from 2018. I actually found something for 2018 that like nobody updates the CRM. I'm sitting here going, I don't think that's changed five years later. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it hasn't, right? That like I could just pull that in from 2018 and I don't know how much of it changed, but probably not much. And that's the problem. Who's going to push sales? Because marketing can't be a sales, hey, sales, hey, sales, hey, sales, hey, sales, because then it just becomes an adversarial mm -hmm. relationship. I've seen this firsthand. When marketing was having to report on salespeople who weren't, uh, who weren't following up within the SLA timeline. Sales, go hold yourselves accountable. Why are we doing this? Now we're the bad guys. And mm -hmm. so there, is, there are some pitfalls, I think, with marketing being a majority owner that I do think have to be well thought through, especially with how often sales is in that platform. And honestly, with honestly, uh, how much power sales tends to have within any given organization too. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think... The, it depends. You're going to hear this several more times until we end this episode is it, you need to think about your business model, um, the size of your company. Um, how do you grow? And I think that's going to help you answer again, who owns this? I'm thinking where my mind's going is like MJ Smith from CoLab Larry had a post about this today, talking about if you're in series A, um, they're going to hire a VP of marketing first before they hire a VP of sales. Um, great. You, you own the CRM, right? <laughs> You're the person who has to own it. There's no one else. And the other thought, again, this is really just kind of simplifying it is I don't think it matters about what department and what person does it. What you need is like that strong leader that's going to come in and really give that direction. It, it needs to come from the executive leadership, right? Is, um, great. <laughs> this is who's owning it. I've hired you to do it. I think that's where you're going to get the most movement. I think when you're a bigger company, that may be more challenging, but I know for a fact, like when I worked at Caterpillar, right? <laughs> like it's a huge company. The strongest leaders get stuff done. Like that's just a fact. Um, and mm -hmm. you can really see it. So that's kind of where my mind went as well. Um, you want to go to the last one or you, anything else you want to talk about with Quincy Johnson's? I, I, I do think, you know, go back to your point, um, and I love, you know, if, if you're hiring VP of marketing and you don't have a, a fully defined sales function yet, then of course, by default, marketing is going to have to own it, right? But then you get to series B, you get to series C, you get to series D, then what happens, right? Because as the company evolves, I think the ownership and the processes and the governance have to evolve. And at some point, instead of, you know, early stage startup, everybody's wearing many hats. Well, you start to get more defined hats, um, if you will, right? Personally, I'd like a fedora, um, yeah. but but <laughs> but my wife might you know question that. But anyway, um, you know, as you get as as your company grows and matures, though, who's going to own it? That question needs to be answered before you get there. And, and if you're already there and you're already struggling with, okay, who's owning this? Now take this as a sign. I'm not literally holding a sign, but pretend I am. It says, go have the conversation. Who owns your CRM, right? Because <laughs> somebody needs to run point. That doesn't mean they're running it by themselves. But, you know, there is, uh, the CRM is so important to so many facets of the organization. 
that there is an inflection point. And if you can get ahead of it early and know, okay, at this point in time, when we reach this point, then this person is going to own it, or we need to hire a specific role to drive us forward. And maybe it's more than just the CRM, maybe it's tech debt in general. That's going to set up your company for long-term success. And I think that that that's maybe one of the key takeaways uh, that we're coming from here. But transitioning yeah, to the last comment, Dale Harrison, uh, who is also a good LinkedIn follow. Um, he's He's got... He's not afraid to challenge uh, some 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 takes, but he does it with data, which I really really mm-hmm. like. He's got a wealth of experience. Uh, he and he and Mark uh, Stiles actually uh, will go back and forth, or usually will agree, kind of kind of feed off of each other. It's awesome to see. I learn a lot from from both of them. Um, and so he said, "Look, if there's no chief revenue officer, the CRO should own it first. So I went, ooh, again, a different take here. And that, that gets back, we'll, we'll touch on this in a second. But if no chief revenue officer, then sales should own it. If they're capable properly, it should be under RevOps. So we literally just hit our bingo card here in one sentence. Uh, so let's, let's take it from the top. Chief revenue officer. So that gets back to that joint revenue team, right? And I think that's the model that more companies are starting to adopt. Why do we have a sales and marketing team when they, when combined they own 100% of the net new acquisition? Now, there's a whole other conversation around marketing is also able to impact customer retention and there's sales, but there's also customer success. That's another, that's another thing in general. But because most companies have a dedicated marketing team and a dedicated sales team, Combining those with joint leadership um, is a, a growing trend uh, that, that I am seeing. I have reported to a chief revenue officer before. Sales and marketing were both you know, separate teams, same leader. I have noticed that CROs tend to be salespeople. Um, I am seeing that. I'm not really seeing marketing backgrounds in the CRO chair, which I question to be honest with you, I mean, I don't question because I get it. Well, salespeople have the numbers, <laughs> you know, uh, so I, I get it. Uh, at the same point, I wonder if some companies are setting themselves back. Again, another conversation for another time. Uh, there's so many conversations. Gosh, I didn't realize what Pandora's box we were opening here. Um, but I think if possible, yes, a chief, a, a chief revenue officer, that team, then you could have RevOps sitting adjacent to sales and marketing and reporting to the same leader. And I think that works. Let's just stop. I'll, I'll stop there. Kind of toss that thought over to you. And we can come back and explore sales in a minute. Yeah, I think where my mind's really ending at um, through this whole conversation is um, depends on your business, <laughs> depends on your growth. Like, how do you grow? Um, depends at what stage, if you're startup, what series are you at? And like, that's going to help you answer these questions. I think if I was to summarize, like the key learnings that you and I talked about is um, one scale <laughs> is your biggest challenge, because when you grow as a business, you have to solve that. And IT has to be a part of it. There's just... No way they can't be when the MarTech and the tech stack gets that big. Um, other things that I just love that we talked about, um, all five of these people had different opinions and that's awesome. <laughs> Everyone had a different perspective. Did not expect which, that. If that teaches you something, it's form your own POV and then own it. Um, other things I loved is this idea of governance because with governance, you need diplomacy. You need to understand how I can help someone out in this position and then how does that impact someone here? And like really trying to own that. I don't know what job title and job function does it, but I think if anyone owns it and if you own it, you're probably going to get better, right? So I think mm-hmm. governance was awesome. Um, harmony, kumbaya. Yeah, I mean, why not? Let's just try to make it the best it can be and bringing everyone together. Was it um, Rising Tide Lifts All Boats? I love that idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I really think last point is just, you just got to think about what stage your company's at. And I think that's going to help you answer who owns a CRM. Was there any other like just key learnings you want to summarize at the end here? You know, th- this this pulls in one of my favorite marketing charts of all time, which I think came out maybe early in 2023, which is they 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 surveyed a whole bunch of people and found uh, like I think it was like almost 20 percent of marketers said that their tech stack was more complex than a black hole. <laughs> you know, mm. <laughs> what what do you think is contributing to that? Well, the CRM is going to be pain point number one, probably, unless you're one of those people that got thrown an intent data platform and said go do ABM and had nothing else to do with it. <clears throat> Not that I've seen that happen, but uh, it, you know, we, we, we've heard those stories. Um, but the CRM is going to be one of those black holes, right? There's so many time and resources that no matter what size, stage, revenue, wherever in the world uh, your company is located or based out of, the CRM is going to be a backbone of the organization, either at some point in the future or has been for years. 
are you getting your maximum ROI from that and other parts of your tech stack? Uh, and when was the last time you actually audited this? Yeah, I will say there are third-party vendors. They're really good at this. It, this this might be the time where, hey, marketing budgets are going down. We know that, right? Okay, well, if marketing owns some of this technology, maybe now's the time to let them cut loose on some things. They can free up time and resources for other stuff that, that is more strategically important, and you can get rid of some of the tech debt that's weighing down some of your processes. Now, the CRM is just the foundational building block upon which so much of that is built. Um, but understanding who owns it in your organization and then the, asking the question, should they? <laughs> can open up, yes, a whole Pandora's box, but frankly, can lead to a lot of innovation within your company uh, and operational efficiency. It ain't sexy, but it absolutely makes the company money. Love it. You know, with this show and with what I want you to do in your marketing career is if you ask questions, you get answers. I think that's why this makes it a very good question because I learned some stuff today. I also want to say thank you for bringing this format. I actually really enjoyed it, <laughs> just reacting to stuff and thinking it maybe think a little harder than a normal show. So I appreciate that. Um, last thing for the listeners is um, this is really hard for marketing. Um, Caleb and I were just talking through all the problems. If you need help, reach out to Caleb, reach out to me, reach out to Mary. We don't have the answers, but we certainly will help you try to find them. Caleb, where do you want the listeners to find you? LinkedIn, uh, just Caleb Rule, C-A-L-E-B-R-U-L-E, or you can come say hello uh, in the X of Five community. I am active there, or calebrule.com, just my personal portfolio, but you want to creep on me a little bit or just kind of see some other podcasts I've been on or, or anything like that, uh, come say hi. I would certainly love to say hello. Uh, my DMs are certainly open. Awesome, and you'll certainly come back for part three. We'll figure out the next piece of the CRM. We'll when Mary hunts me down, got it. I'll be, I'll be prepared. Yeah. <laughs> the, the last one would just be a battle between you and Mary. The, there we go. I think we all know who's going to win that battle. It ain't me. Uh <laughs> for sure. So, listeners, I appreciate you. This is available on, on podcasts. I will really leave you with this. It is who owns the CRM? It's you. <laughs>